yeah, so let's get started. So why don't I, I just ask all of you to give an introduction about yourself. Uh, feel free to discuss like what the, in general, what you work on. And we'll start with Dr. Filion. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so Andre, <laughs> Fili on, Andre Filion, um, I've been at McMaster for about five years now. Uh, and uh, my, uh, you know, I, I, I wear a number of different hats at Mc, Mc, McMaster. So uh, I'm an associate professor in our department. And I'm also the director of our uh, experiential learning office. And so, and so in the, the role as director of the ELO, I'm responsible for first year. Uh, so I'm leading the charge to develop uh, engineer, uh, the engineer 1P13, as well as we're also developing some upper year courses on experiential learning. My, my research area involves everything related to casting and solidification. Um, so that uh, starts with uh, doing, uh, developing mac macro scale or process models uh, that predict uh, crack and porosity formation. We look at uh, macro segregation, um, and uh, as, as well as look, look looking at and developing models for for microstructure ev evolution. And really, what uh, what I'm interested in is is coupling knowledge of the process. So how uh, temperature and stress strain uh, evolve during casting, uh, with another with the microstructure development uh, as well as defects, de defect development. And so when I use the word casting, that doesn't just mean casting at uh, ArcelorMittal or Stelco, right? So that could be constrained casting, so additive manufacturing. Uh, and, and welding, as well as shape castings uh, and other type of casting processes. Now, the other thing that I'm really interested in is, is 3D imaging. And so I've brought along a cool video here to, to show you if I can share my screen here. Um, so really what I've brought, just brought along is this, this one video that I hope you can see here. So this, this is some experiments that we did at the Diamond Light Source in the UK when we imaged uh, steel as it was solidifying in 3D. And we made this really funky alloy. So it was an iron hafnium alloy. So we added hafnium so we could see what was going on. And, and so here you're looking at a cross section. So the center of the sample as the dendrites are forming. And so with this information, then you can do a lot of analysis and really learn about how the morphology of grains um, evolves dur during solidification. So I guess I'll, uh, I'll pass the bat baton over to, oh, I have to end sharing my screen somehow. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for the, the video. It's very cool. I don't um, remember so, so, how to do that. Uh, oh, it's it's okay. I think I can even maybe cancel it. Oh no, maybe not. It's okay. We we can just continue then. Uh, oh, Dr. Here it is. Dr. Yeah. Rubel, how how do you feel? Uh, please describe, I guess, generally who you are and what you do in the department. Uh, I I believe you're muted. Yes. <laughs> there okay, you go. No, no, it is. Yeah, I joined about five and a half years ago. And uh, before this, I moved through different countries. I spent, started in Ukraine, spent some time in Germany, then in Northern Ontario in Thunder Bay, and then uh, finally at McMaster. So every time I was doing something related to computation and materials. Um, the work we do is, has really many dimensions. Um, so it's hard to say which exactly application we're aiming for. I guess we're aiming uh, almost every <laughs> possible applications. Um, and it ranged from things like batteries, uh, solar cell materials, to uh, materials for 
uh, quantum electronics, so the quantum materials. So this is some type of materials which are, don't have really well specified application at the moment. <laughs> People try to make something fancy uh, with them. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it really ranges. Uh, so we also work with metals, but the different special kind of metals, uh, some topological metals um, that can be used uh, in quantum applications. Uh, and the main job is to take the atomic structure and turn it into properties. Uh, because we want to establish that structure property relationship and done it at the atomic scale. So of course, not all properties can be mapped at the atomic scale. Uh, there are some difficult ones, uh, but we try to capture what we can. And uh, if you ask, for instance, uh, what is the charge potential of your lithium ion battery that you have in a cell phone? So that's one of the property that you can really uh, map at the atomic scale. Uh, but if you uh, take, um, say, a body of your phone, uh, the outer shell, and ask what is the strength of of this material, then I will have no definite answer to that question. So it means uh, if somebody tells you we can calculate everything, that is not really true. Uh, but we should understand where the limits are. And the interesting parts are pushing boundaries of these limits uh, is to enable calculating of the new properties, uh, which were not possible to calculate before. And that's where our group is trying to make a difference. So we work on this software as well. So if I, I don't have a slide, so sorry, <laughs> but um, I know it's a computational club, right? So, and I thought that you guys will probably appreciate uh, a Git page. Uh, yes. So the Git is a platform uh, where people distribute the software and it is also a platform uh, where we try to distribute the software that um, uh, we create. So some of these software that you can see here, for instance, that one is called a Berry Pi software. And that is for calculation of polarization in solids. Um, and it is written in Python from the, um, from the announcement and, uh, for this event, I realized you're big fans of Python. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. So we have other codes, for instance, uh, for calculating of the effective masses. Uh, it's called the M star. Uh, have anybody taken the uh, 3Q class or 2Q, 2Q class and know something about the effective masses from the audience? Uh, I second years have taken 2Q for the, I, I've taken 2Q for the most part. Most of that, I think the audience is second year. So second year in the process, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah. So ca calculation effective mass is in relation that to some optical and transport properties in the material and some bend structure calculations. These are this uh, faulty block uh, packages. Maybe there will be some figure to show here. Oh, here's one. Yeah. I don't know if you have seen a bend structure before. Um, but uh, these are some interesting ones, the um, electronic structure with defects. So looking at how defects behave, you can sometime uh, get some new properties of, out of the materials by engineering those defects. Um, so basically work on programming and making software to extend capabilities of the first principle calculation to um, push boundaries uh, of the current uh, abilities. Um, I think, Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I'm just gonna pass it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's, that last sentence more or less is a really good uh, description of what, from, from what I've heard from your grad students or other undergraduate researchers, what you do. So yeah, mm -hmm. thanks for that. Uh, Dr. Greenwood, please uh, take the mic and describe yourself, what you do and yeah, go for it. Yeah, I have a little bit of a meandering past. Um, I oh, started yeah. <laughs> it, I started out in uh, pure physics uh, back in 1995. At uh, I went to school at Dalhousie University. Um, I actually the first experiments I did was co-op work term. I did lithium battery research with Jeff Don out, out there. So we were doing cathode uh, development. So I did a lot of experimental work there. 
Um, I was really got into physics because I really wanted to understand the origins of gravity nothing material related at all. And the mathematics were so complex. And I realized after a while that I just couldn't devote my life to a theory which may or may not be right. Uh, so then I actually left physics entirely, went into computer science. Um, I lasted about a year in computer science and realized that it actually had direct applications back in physics and in materials. And that's when I actually went back and actually really fell in love with physics again. Um, and I got involved actually doing uh, some soap foam modeling it was my first ever computational model. And I did this in my undergrad. So this is something you guys can probably do too. If I can actually show a little picture. I actually was going through some old files. So this is a 20, how do I share my screen here? Uh, the big shared uh, oh, green go. button in the middle. Yeah. Let me just share my VLC window. So it's just simple as 2D foam where you have uh, internal pressures of bubbles, you have diffusion, which occurs across the grain boundaries, which cause curvature of edges, you get topological transformations. And here we have what we called our laser tweezers, where we're actually applying a force. Sorry, Mike, to... uh, are you sharing your screen right now? Uh, yes. Oh, I think you okay. have to click confirm. Ah, there you go. There Perfect. we go. Okay, I'll just show Perfect. you. Perfect. Oh, wow. Flashbacks. Yeah, so flashbacks. This was actually just a small scale. You could actually do a much, much larger scale. But uh, yeah, so those were the little green dot was to kind of the electronic tweezers. But in this I had, because there was very little tools at the time. So I had to develop my own graphic software to be able to visualize this because we didn't have things at the time. Uh, so the code itself was written all in C, including the graphics. Uh, so that's just kind of a flashback. Um, from there, let me just stop sharing. From there, uh, I went on to grad school, and that's when I came to McMaster. Uh, I was working with uh, Nick Provatis. I don't know, most of the undergrads probably don't rec remember him, but he was chair of the department for a few years, and he moved on to McGill. And that's when I got into more microstructure modeling and really learned the wonderful world of metallurgy. Uh, so nowadays, what I do is I do a lot of microstructure modeling, and I do atomistic modeling as well. And now I'm getting more into fluid dynamics to really st uh, understand um, process property relationships. Uh, and so what kind of microstructure you get it, how you alter the chemistry, how does this affect the underlying microstructure. And now we're trying to do projects where we're tying all of these models together that can actually predict uh, microstructure property and process microstructure together. So you can actually do a full throughput simulation. Um, I'll just share screen again. And we're going to share this one and make sure I actually click share this time. So just kind of show uh, an idea there. So you have uh, your microstructure, which can lead to a, like a very fine microstructure leading to kind of a more grain evolution. You'll see this here has got a picture very similar to my bubbles. We actually modified that code to actually do grain coarsening studies. Uh, this was done in collaboration with students at University of British Columbia, where we were actually developing this model to do grain coarsening and recrystallization phenomena. Uh, and we then built a mean field model to, to do that. Uh, we were tying this in with uh, crystal plasticity, which leads to yield surfaces, which can then be tied into full blown finite element uh, codes where you can actually do the deformation of parts and be able to predict uh, other properties. Um, I do a lot of work in uh, microstructures right now in welding. So doing a lot of joining simulations. We couple this, we do a lot of thermal finite element simulations trying to get the thermal path. Uh, we have uh, this both in pipeline and now we're doing projects with uh, Hydro-Quebec uh, to do work in simulation and kind of tying in the microstructure. So we're doing microstructure simulations, coupling to the thermal history that we get based on what we do in terms of the weld pass. So as you decide how big of a bead you're gonna lay, what rate and what power you put into your weld will determine your thermal property. If you want to do a, like a, what's called a dual torch where you have two torches in combination, then you can get different thermal histories. Uh, then down, if you zoom into say the, what we call the heat affected zone. So it's an area where the metal doesn't melt, but you get thermal diffusion into that bulk. You can actually get the, the underlying microstructure can change, which means you get a gradient of properties. And this can actually affect the underlying uh, material integrity. 
Uh, so we're really trying to understand how the microstructure will change as a function of these welding properties. Um, and back back to my uh, PhD and what I'm doing now a lot is a uh, my bread and butter is kind of the solidification modeling, where we develop um, high performance computing simulations where we use massive computers to simulate full like 3D uh, simulations of, of dendritic growth and how the solutes will segregate in pattern. Um, more recently, I've been getting into uh, machine learning. So this was, was in the last three or four years. I don't have any slides on that, but uh, in particular, what I'm interested in two areas of machine learning, one is in what's called transfer learning, where you have uh, data sets which are deficient, so you don't have a lot of them. So you take models like these microstructure models and actually pre-train systems on there so that it can learn the fundamentals of how, like say, solute partitions or what kind of microstructures form. And then you take real experimental data after the fact you pre-trained this neural network to predict something, then you bring in the small sample of experimental set to actually correct that uh, initial model training. And then you can then train on a much, but it also has more of a physical basis in it. Uh, the other area of machine learning that uh, we're really interested in is the area of active learning. And so this is where the machine makes decisions based on the history of the data it's received. And so it's what it's trying to do is it's trying to make next optimal decisions to be able to produce either achieve a goal or to best have a surrogate model for a landscape that you're exploring. So what, we, what we're terming at our workplace here is called uh, MAPS. So these are materials autonomous development platforms where you have a robotic system which can control the flow of an experiment uh, and the machine learning system decides what experiment is going to be done next in this high throughput simulation or sorry, experimentation. Um, and so the one we're doing specifically now is on thermoelectric materials. And so what this involves is cast, uh, selecting an alloy chemistry, casting that alloy, sectioning it, and then measuring the properties. And so this is fed back into the machine. It builds a model of how it thinks the performance of that material is going to be based on its initial inputs. And then it will decide what experiment to do next to, to either uh, explore regions it doesn't really know very well, or to test areas that it thinks is going to get the best performance and see how well its model performs. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Thanks for describing uh, <laughs> in detail, basically, where you left off. So I always think that that's a really cool story to share, <laughs> especially when you say meandering. Um, OK, so let, let's continue then. So let's. Uh, Let's actually ask, um, I have a question for all of you in that since that MSc is one of the departments in engineering that hire like one of the most undergraduate researchers. So this coming summer, are you thinking about taking summer students? And let's start with Dr. Philly on with that. I think your mic's muted, uh, Dr. Philly on. Yeah. <laughs> like so that. we're always looking for uh, good summer students, uh, good co-op students. Um, this this coming summer, there might be opportunities um, on the modeling side uh, to to work on uh, a, a process model that we're developing with with Stelco, uh, and also to do some thermodynamic calculations. Uh, using thermocalc uh, on a project that uh, that we have to look at nick nickel soup super alloys. Uh, on the uh, experimental side, for people who are more interested in doing experiments, we uh, we we've got some really uh, cool equipment uh, that allows us to do a tensile test at uh, at 1300 degrees Celsius while observing the the sample fail, and so. There would be some opportunities there for, for developing the test protocol and then also do, doing some image analysis to understand uh, what we've actually seen. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Like, especially for me, uh, I, I'm wondering for the in situ tensile test where you can operate at high temperatures, is it an optical micro, uh, microscope or electron? It's a con it is an optical microscope. It's a it's a confocal uh, mm. laser scanning uh, mic optical mic mic microscope. Cool. 
So it works something like an SEM in that the beam rasters over the surface, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's using light instead of electrons. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool, at least for me, because uh, I have a lot of experience doing like op like flow observations in videos, for example, like if I click a point on a microstructure and then I and, and then I pull the metal in various frames, can I track it and keep where it's going? And then from that, if you do it on a grid, you can get like a strain graph. So that's something that we're going to be covering in like the club actually eventually. So I thought it'd be cool to bring up. So yeah, cool. Yes, yes. We, we, uh, we, uh, we have some 3D software in that oh. that we could we could talk about uh, at another yeah. time if if you'd like, um, because we've done that uh, for, uh, we did uh, x-ray tomographic imaging of paper as, as mm. we were pulling pa paper apart. Yeah. Uh, and then looking at the development of strain fields in different mm -hmm. types of papers. Cool. Nice, yeah, definitely I'll hit you up on that at some time. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Rubel, how is it looking for you this summer? Or just in general with your summer students? So the last year I said I will have no summer students and we ended up with three. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, let me make no prognosis this yeah, time yeah. because it looks like my my ability to make any prognosis is not good at all. <laughs> um, so if, if I end up with any summer students this time, I think I'd like them to work more on the programming um, side. Uh, so what we do is what I showed to you are uh, not just a standalone codes. They are designed to work as plugin codes. Um, so they work with a bigger density functional simulation uh, software and uh, we need to make an interfaces with this software and we want to make sure that our code, um, I would say it's uh, uh, proof, bulletproof <laughs> against uh, errors. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't produce a segmentation fault, uh, but always give a nice error message, right? Uh, so we basically have to test it from different sites. And what is more important is we have to deliver it to, to users in, um, I would say most user-friendly uh, way. And uh, that is not very straightforward too. Before we saw, okay, just write a Python code and, and put it out, but uh, that's not the case. So then it turns out it depends on this and this version of this library and this library, and it's hard to predict what the outcome will be. So right now we want to make something uh, or turn our developments into something really solid and uh, make, uh, maybe like package them together in a better way so that uh, people just get a one file that is completely usable uh, on the Linux system yeah. and then test that. Uh, so having mm, tests done um, and uh, packaging, this is probably a major thing that would probably fit into the interests of the club. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and it's it's funny you mentioned because you're thinking that if you end up do hiring students that they'll be doing the programming side of things because at, at least in the club right now, most of our new members are second year material students and they only have like the first year experience if uh, if even that not too much because uh, it's it's been a while. So mm -hmm. right now we're actually like working on different uh, mini projects to train them on different things like like just like you mentioned, reading and using different libraries and writing your own libraries to be reusable as well. And also something that you might find interesting is that you mentioned that you want it to be user-friendly and sometimes like just writing a Python script with a bunch of dependencies and asking them a, a client, for example, to run it on terminal, that's not very realistic in many ways. And for example, uh, where I'm working now at Hatch, we, we kind of have the system where we write things in Python, for example, for our models and optimizations, mm -hmm. but then we'll send it to a digital team who can like interface that onto a web application that's hosted online, which just runs the Python script, but it has all the native uh, dependencies. So that might be something interesting that students could do. So mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, yeah that, that would be nice if we, if we can also freeze those dependencies too oh, yeah. in, in the code. So we <laughs> yeah. don't uh, give a whole list of prerequisites mm -hmm. uh, with the code. So it works mm -hmm. with this and this version, doesn't work with the higher, don't go lower, yeah. Uh, yeah. just use only that. And that. this, uh, I think, scares away some users mm -hmm. uh, who are not so fluent. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. And 
it, and since I'm moving to my Greenwood now, there's a project that Sarah's been working on where she's trying to get this Python 2 code working that only works on Linux. And it's it's taken like more or less a month now, but we finally got it working. And it's basically what you mentioned. It's just dependencies and trying to figure out what versions and, and even operating system was a factor. But anyways, yeah, lots of potential things to work on. Great. Um, the mic, why don't you uh, take the stand? And because uh, I, I know that you're not, uh, at least right now, full-time uh, part of McMaster, but how does it work with you with grad students that you might take on or even summer students? Well, grad students are easier mm -hmm. because uh, generally what I end up doing is I end up partnering with another faculty professor. Um, now it's a lot easier with the new way rules that they do in NSERC that I can actually be official partners, not just uh, a collaborator on these grants where I can become uh, like a co-supervisor or even like a lead supervisor with students. Um, but we, our lab does periodically take uh, co-op students um, and we hire other students through various avenues. In fact, actually with our partner at NRC, not our lab, uh, but through that MAPS project that I was telling you about, uh, we're actually looking for a student for the winter term, either part-time or full-time, uh, either as a co-op or not. Um, to help us develop some of the programming and databases and data management uh, accesses for what's coming out of the robotic systems. So that's something that we're actually looking for right now. Um, it's, it's hard to say what would come up in the summer because that'll depend a lot on where the funding is coming from. Yeah. Yeah, and, and actually for, for that one, is that the one that you mentioned to me that was with Harvard or is or the slag with DeFasco or something else? No, this, this one is with NRC, they're doing uh, right, okay. catalysis um, map. So we're doing the thermal electrics and they're doing a catalysis map uh, where they're do, do, developing new cool. catalysts. And uh, let's say but, like- oh, the under, I was just gonna say the underlying infrastructure of all the data collection, the machine learning is the same across all of these different maps. And, and, and just for my own interest and for those who are listening and will listen after the recording, uh, what, what do you think would be like the, I guess, technical requirements of a job of, of sorts for the winter for, one? For, that, for the winter one is really having skills in Python. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the big, big bonus there would be uh, database development because we're going to be developing our own database. Um, and then we're also going to be doing uh, web portal development. Yeah, thanks for that. All right, so let's move on then. Um, so I, so now that we digress into a little bit more about what you're kind of working on now, whether it be this summer or with Mike in this winter, I'd like to ask all of you what's kind of like your most recent project. And uh, in addition to describing it, I wanna also ask um, where do you think it could potentially go? Like let's say a uh, couple of years down the line, whenever like the project is quote unquote finished or near the end of its life cycle, what, what are the applications for it and how will it more or less affect materials in our department as well as just, you know, technology as a whole in society. So I'll, I'll start with again, Dr. Filion. So uh, feel free to take the stage. Yeah, sure. And, and sorry about the interruption there. Um, yeah, so I, I, I mean, my, my projects are, are really very closely tied with industry. And so the, the work that, that my research does, it impacts uh, the, the, the quality and efficiency of an industrial process. Um, and it also and and it also su supports our, our use of novel metallic mater materials. So, for example, right now we're working on a project uh, with Liberty to to try to improve the, the way in which they repair turbines. And so, if we, if we're successful, and I'm sure we we will be, then that will support them. Um, in reducing the, the cost for the turbine repairs, but also in, in, in enlarging this, the space in which turbines can be repaired rather than scrapped and having to form new, new, new parts. Cool, fantastic. And I, I heard a little bit from Bosco and, I, and Dr. Yu, if, I don't know how accurate this is, but uh, that you also did some work, for example, with one of your co-op students like Kelly who's I think fourth year right now in additive manufacturing. And uh, I'm wondering if you could like elaborate a little bit on that. 
Yeah, so we have a couple projects related to add, additive manufacturing. Uh, one, one of the things that we're really interested in um, is doing additive manufacturing from, uh, from elemental for from elemental powders. So if if you're you're interested if you're using a selective laser melting process, right now by and large the way that we create the material for that is we start with 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 uh, an ingot or a billet that's already the alloy that we want, uh, and then we, we atomize that ma ma material. But there are a couple of challenges with that. One is, is that it's very difficult to vary the alloy chem chemistry because it goes through a lot of, of steps. Um, and, and so then you're stuck with using a lot of the tra traditional alloys that already exist. So we're working uh, on some applications where you would start with powders um, that are in their elemental form. Uh, or some powders that are easily uh, re readily available and say a, like a bimetallic form um, and then combining them together so that then when you do the selective laser melting, you create the alloy in situ. Cool, fantastic. So we're working on that and then mm -hmm. we're working on, on modeling to try to understand how that process actually uh, what what the what the un underlying uh, physics are um, to understand how the alloying occurs during the process. Great, that's a perfect explanation of uh, from what I heard as well. Actually, so thanks for that, uh, Dr. Rubel. So uh, I and I would like to preface this with from what I understand too. Like you're very involved with your co-op students that you take. Like for example, uh, I talked to Mitchell Albert who gave a talk uh, on behalf of the department as well who did, I think, like somewhat of a 12 month term with you doing uh, modeling for, or either modeling or simulation for uh, like biomedical, what is it, uh, coatings. So definitely like feel free to include that as well or whatever you think is really cool that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we work in is what we get funded. <laughs> and right. uh, that basically decides uh, more or less the direction. So one of the recent application we submit is, is not yet funded, uh, but we are waiting for a decision which has uh, collaborators in chemical engineering and chemistry on development of the new batteries, the zinc ion batteries. So if that works, uh, there will be, uh, I think, a one PhD student who would go into that uh, direction and we can look at, uh, like Mike mentioned, I, we should probably talk more. <laughs> uh, we're gonna look at the cathode material and specifically model uh, the process of charging and discharging uh, of the material and try to learn if uh, the computational model is predictive enough, uh, not only there, there are certain things we know we can calculate, like um, the charge and discharge energy uh, and uh, the voltage, but we are more interested also in predicting um, the longevity of the materials. So that's more difficult question is how long it will last, how many cycles. Uh, so we don't know yet uh, how to do it. And I'm afraid no one knows yet. That's a difficult uh, part of this work is you basically, if, if somebody uh, is coming thinking, okay, so now he is going to be two steps ahead of me and tell me what to do exactly. No, I don't. Um, and uh, yeah, we have to figure out uh, everything. And uh, maybe a good starting point in that case is usually to test cases which works and which don't. And that's probably generally a good good thing to do. Is uh, that's something I actually learned from buyer people. Uh, they always have positive and negative tests because, like materials, we're always happy with a positive test, right? So if we want to make something better and we achieve it better, we say, okay, that's great works so and and we go from there so in the biology it doesn't work that way they always need to have a negative test to show that whatever they got is not an exit 
accident of uh, something uh, not an experimental artifact so they have built better understanding if you say you have certain properties that you optimize and you think you got an idea of how to do that then you just apply the same idea backward and say okay so in order to screw it up completely i need to do this this and this and then you test if it really screws up the property and if it does then you can say you understand what you're doing so that's probably will be our strategy uh in terms of the new electrodes for batteries and um the the other thing which uh, we are planning to look at two uh, two-dimensional materials and we're already looking into this it has probably less of um, how to say uh, applied uh, concept in it. Um, they're more of a general interest, so they have some interesting um, interaction between uh, excitations in these materials, which are not the same as in uh, bulk materials. And uh, we also plan to look into uh, more into materials, uh, so-called topological materials. Um, so if we took, uh, I don't know, the, the old version 1ML3, we all learned that the conduction band is on the top, valence band is at the bottom, right? So the topological material things are upside down. So you have a valence band or the band that has a valence character is on the top and the band that has conduction band character is at the bottom. So, and it produces some interesting physical effects. Uh, um, and if you look at the most recent publications, uh, um, what are the hottest topics right now in materials, this will be topological materials. So we want to uh, build, um, build the software that can identify those materials, can characterize these materials and can predict certain measurable uh, properties on these materials. But there, if you ask what they're good for, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I remember when we first talked, you kind of mentioned that, yeah, sometimes we just do research to see, you know, explore it. And then, and, and then kind of like, I think you gave an example where it's like where in the past, sometimes they'll just kind of mix things around and be like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And then we can use it for this, but kind of exploratory yeah. research is also necessary in that sense as well. Yeah, the good example would be E equal MC square. That's the one that you said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when, when people ask Einstein, wow, well, that's a lot of energy if you just <laughs> convert mass into C square. And he said, well, Ada, you will never get it. That energy, forget about it. And then uh, he wrote a letter to that time president saying, well, maybe we can make uh, some atomic industry out of it. And that time they, they were war so they were looking for a bomb um, <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so you never know where the research will turn i guess it's it it's it's hard to say sometime to see yeah. that far forward <laughs> yeah great analogy mm -hmm. um all right thank you thank you for that dr rule uh dr greenwood why don't you go ahead Okay, I think I already covered a little bit of what I was doing so I right. talked a little bit about the maps mm -hmm. uh but uh I'll also mention that uh, there's two other kind of major projects that we're doing now. One is, I kind of mentioned with uh, Hydro-Quebec and the pipeline doing the welding. So we're trying to, to tie these different microstructure models. So there's a lot of computational work being done in developing these models and making them efficient enough to be able to run them close to real time in 2D. Uh, and in 3D, the, the, you take a lot longer, but then you try to draw correlations between the 3D effects and the 2D simulations that you do in real time. Um, and then the other one is really in a casting project where we do like fluid dynamic simulations and then tie the, the transfer and the heat transfer of that in with the solidification problem to do uh, thin wall casting in the automotive industry. So trying to make um, new materials for say turbocharger technologies and trying to make them more, more efficient. Um, where we're going in the future really is around the maps. So I mentioned the thermoelectrics, but I just thought I'd mention you talked about topological materials. I'm going to bring up our architecture materials, which is something that both uh, Sarah and Arrhenius are working on. 
Uh, it's basically a material where you build the substructure of the material to get a different property or a more novel property of the material. So you combine the base properties of the material and you can combine them in novel architecture ways. So that you, you end up with a more macro property which gives a different phenomena. Uh, and so this would eventually be tied to where we want to go in 3D printing, where we want to build uh, a 3D printing map. Um, and another area where we want to do map is in with high entropy alloys. And so this is where you have uh, a, a large combination of elements put together in roughly equal uh, chemical compositions, and then just kind of looking and trying to explore that novel space. We don't really know yet what the applications are going to be for the high entropy alloys specifically, but uh, right now it's kind of a new novel alloy that we really want to explore and find out what the properties are. And then maybe as uh, Dr. Rubel said, We'll, the, uh, the applications will come later on once we start really understanding the properties. Cool. And, and I know you mentioned a little bit about the uh, maps that you were working on and we talked about earlier. Could you describe that a little bit further in sense of uh, what the possibility, because you, you mentioned how it works, but what are kind of the possibilities that if, you know, if everything goes well and it does efficiently create a database and then make really good decisions based on that, what is so kind of end game? Yeah, so the end game of maps isn't really to uh, discover anything new in except, well, it's to discover th new things, but it's not like we're developing a new uh, methodology of doing the experiments. It's more that we're now taking it out of human hands and making it more systematic. Uh, and then this allows the machine to really make decisions so that you can drive through. So it combines two things. One is what we call a high throughput experimentation. So you could do experiments in a very quick fashion and it's all being ro robotically controlled so they can run 24 seven. Uh, and then the other side is the machine learning where it's actually making more intelligent decisions instead of doing what we call a grid search where you just have a parameter set and you just kind of step through it and do that. The machine might just arbitrarily start randomly picking different locations and then it'll hone in for a little while to get a good understanding. And the real idea around this, and this is an international uh, initiative, is to really discover the materials much faster that we need to solve things like climate change. So how do we get these more energy efficient materials and get them to market a much quicker? Yeah, no, definitely that, that's 100% it. And I, I know Sarah has like a big interest in energy and this is kind of relating to that as well, as well as the, what Dr. Rule mentioned with his interest in zinc, uh, zinc iron, iron batteries. And definitely like, I, I, I think for me as well, like I, I definitely envision myself working in uh, the future of the energy industry, as well as optimizing it with different techniques. And this is pretty damn cool. And that's why I asked you to talk about it. So yeah, thanks for that, Mike. And I, I think we'll, we'll have time for one more question. And, it, and since now we spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time asking you all about what you do and going kind of a little bit dive deeping into low level, like tell me exactly the kind of materials research you do, but we're also really interested in uh, the kind of human journey, I guess, to, into how you are the way you are. And Mike, you talked about that as well. And I'd like to formally ask, so when did you kind of know, or I'd like to ask all of you to talk about kind of your progression into uh, like, I guess, school, but also emphasizing on the main question that is when did you, or how and when did you know that you wanted to pr uh, pursue academia and more or less, how are you the way you are now? <laughs> So let's start with uh, Dr. Filion. Oh, well, how, how the way I, I am now <laughs> yeah. is the product of, uh, excuse me, that's my dog who, is, oh, it's okay. who, who knows it's almost supper time. Mm. Um, um, so the way I am now is a product of all sorts of mistakes in life. <laughs> sure, um, yeah, I mean, so I, that, that's a really good question. Sometimes I like to, to say that I, I sort of fell into the role of, of an academic. Um, I went to McMaster as an undergraduate student. Uh, I did a co-op uh, at Celestica for 16 months. Um, and I wasn't really excited about the prospects of uh, working at Celestica for 30 years. Um, I'm, you know, manufacturing engineering just, just wasn't really for me. So I went to grad school, uh, then I had the opportunity to go live in Switzerland for a couple years and have some fun and work with some smart people. Um, 
And so then it just kind of went like that. I, I guess what, what attracts me, um, what, what I find really attractive about aca academia is the ability to do research on a topic that we love, as well as to train the next generation of, of yeah. youth who, who are going to, to better our, our country. And so I, I put a lot of effort into working with graduate students and undergraduate students to pre prepare them um, for what's to come. And so I, I develop my research around that. Fantastic, yeah. And, and I, I do recognize it is a super broad question and how are you the way you are? <laughs> but I'm, I'm thoroughly happy with uh, the response that I got out of asking such a broad question. So thank you for that. <laughs> All right, and Dr. Rubel, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I think it, the best analogy is a Brownian motion. Mm. <laughs> There's no specific direction. That, that, that's next yeah. week's topic of mass transfer. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's next topic. Okay, I'm not gonna go into details on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think it was not really much of my decision, but uh, sometimes you, you you do what you do, you, what you like, and then people come to you and ask, oh, why don't, why don't you want to go into the graduate school? Uh, why don't you want to do a PhD? So I guess um, that's, that was... That was my story like this. So I got my supervisor asked me and I just waited everything and said, well, yeah, maybe that's a good strategy. Um, at this time, I don't think I really like or didn't like the uh, industry environment. I didn't work in the industry, although spent some time uh, you know, like a co-op um, term. But uh, what we were told when we were doing co-op at the university, they said, well, we are sending you for the co-op term to see how not interesting is the industry. So that will encourage your uh, learning at the university. So you want to do something better than this. Um, and uh, yeah, then, then I went through different paths. So I made, I started with uh, manufacturing engineering. So it has nothing to do probably even with material science. And then uh, the PhD was in material science. Then the postdoc was in uh, theoretical physics. That's where I got into all these uh, interesting modeling tools. Um, and uh, what exciting was it, the ability to predict something without even doing some experiments. Um, and then I asked for advice. Uh, that time my supervisor, he told me, ah, forget about this. You will never be able to calculate anywhere large enough system so that it will be meaningful. But then the computer power went up exponentially. So whatever you can do in one year, uh, things change. So, and that eventually become a um, hot topic. Um, so, yeah, that's the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sweet and simple. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Greenwood, why don't you go ahead as well? Sure. Um, I could go back till probably I was probably around six. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was always interested in how things work. I actually still have uh, a book. It's called the Rainbow Fact Book of Science that my parents bought me when I was six years old. Um, and that's really what got me interested in science and just understanding how things work. And actually, I, I referenced it in my thesis. Uh, because it, it's kind of the motivating fact of my life, getting into science and understanding it. Um, I got into computers around when I was 10, maybe 10 or 11, uh, and I really started programming on my Commodore 64. At that time, if you wanted to play a computer game, you had to program it yourself. Uh, you would buy a magazine, you would have the source code in it, and you would have to type it out and play the game, and then eventually you'd find people who would had saved their games on computer disks and you'd be swapping computer disks back and forth and transferring them back and forth. Uh, then I got into to university. Um, so, and, but somewhere in high school, I fixated on physics. Um, I don't know why. 
Um, I think if I had realized it, maybe I was more application driven, but I got very focused on this concept of gravity and really wanted to understand it. Uh, I get it actually kind of mentioned uh, kind of the elephant in the room. Um, I did go through uh, some depression. That's what actually caused me to go through that. Uh, the change from physics to computer science. And it was kind of the idea of getting locked into, I've set my goal to do this and I need to achieve it. So I'm gonna encourage people to not be afraid to, to change directions and, and do what you need to do. Um, actually, I actually had physiological responses to, to all that. I actually had seizures and everything. So, but after realizing that, you know, your life is kind of important, you have to be healthy uh, and be, be willing to make the changes. Everything just changed. They all went away, depression gone, seizures gone. Um, and then that's when I switched to, to computer science. And I actually started really loving having a combination of the theory and being able to control things with the computers. And you can investigate aspects which may not be physical, but they can really give insight into what's going on in the physical world. Um, and just having that level of control and not being afraid to change. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how yeah. I kind of meandered into to, to where I am now. Yeah, yeah that's, wow. I, I, I really like that <laughs> you started at six years old because this is actually the second time that we're doing this kind of uh, event where last time we were with doctor or we were with with biomaterials props and we had Dr. Zutomirsky come in and he also said, oh, back when I was a little kid, whenever I didn't understand something, it would bother me so much that I couldn't go to sleep at night. And then he just, and then that just cascaded into where he is now. And I, I, I really love it when people go into that. <laughs> yeah, that's but. kind of the same thing I did with, <laughs> with gravity. I, I have yeah, some really, like really weird theories of gravity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, like I, I recently just watched a TV show where they're like talking, or like it's a fictional show where they're like gravity and time travel and care black hole, I don't know. It, it's some really cool stuff, like funny stuff. But anyways, um, I, I think I, something that I found whenever I asked that question for not only you guys, but also the biomaterials or any professors that I talk to is that it's really curiosity driven in that you're not necessarily here to like just run away from industry, but th like this is the alternative of industry where you can really explore the curiosity to the fullest potential. And I find that even for myself too, as a 2.5 uh, year student that I guess technically three uh, when I get back. But but anyways, that, that I find that when I started university, I was thinking, okay, I'll go to university, get a job after, be set for the rest of my life, quote unquote. But especially ever, even more so now that I joined the fact or the Department of Materials that the curiosity bug in me, like when I was a kid is growing and growing. And I find myself, and, and you asked me too, Mike, it's like, are you guys considering PhD grad school? And then honestly, the answer right now is completely different from if you would ask me two years ago, which, which is like, I'm pretty sure I am. Uh, but anyways, like, yeah, so thank you. In, in conclusion, thank you all for sharing all of your experiences. And I, I really think that it'll be really valuable, not only from the technical side, but also like when you talk about your inspirations and also uh, kind of the motivations to where you are now, whether, you know, it's from stemming from a child, a childhood obsession of curiosity or kind of just that's how life leads you. But either way, you are where you are here now. And I think it's really cool to share that to us who are really young and kind of just starting out in our careers and have a lot of decisions to make. So this will definitely help, at least for me personally, for that. And in that note, uh, I think we'll end here.